Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another Post Status Live. Um, we do these lives every uh, couple times a month or so when there's really great content that we want to showcase for our team. And one of our sponsors at um, Post Status is WordPress VIP. And I've got to know Sean Oshani. O'Shaughnessy. I even wrote this down. O'Shaughnessy. So O'Shaughnessy. Um, I didn't pick it, you know, <laughs> just the name I was given. Yeah. Well, um, so I've gotten to know Sean. We had a couple conversations. I was like, you know, what's compelling to me is what VIP does. It's, it's this massive Herokian effort to do WordPress, the scale, like I, and I, I've confessed to you, Sean, I've not done WordPress like that. We've had sites that have had really good traffic, but nothing compared to some of the stories we talked about. And so today's topic is doing WordPress at massive scale. And, and another thing I told Sean and members of the VIP team is that, you know, VIP looms big, big shadow within WordPress because you, you all do these types of massive sites. And, but not everybody knows what all goes on with VIP and some of the things that you do. But today, because Sean, and I'll let you talk more about yourself, but Sean is the lead um, solutions engineer. He's got an engineering background at VIP and just talking to some of the stories, I was just asking questions. What would people ask? What are the things that you need to look for? I thought that'd be really compelling content to share with our post status membership. And so um, Sean, tell it before we get into all this, tell us a little bit about yourself, your role at VIP and your, in your role in WordPress, how you came to VIP. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, hi everybody. Um, I have been working in WordPress for, I want to say like 13 years now. Um, and how I got the how I got started in it was um, we I worked at an agency, um, just a little boutique shop in in a sleepy town called Winter Haven, Florida, um, and we somehow got the uh, business to do a blog for Sony PlayStation. Um, and WordPress was still very young and new, and um, so you know we had this design, we had it built out. Um, but at this point in time, there was nowhere that you could take a collection of themes, plugins, WordPress core files, and hand it off to a company who would host this stuff. Um, this was around, I want to say around June of, of 2007. Um, and um, this drew me into a, a side of like, getting into systems, um, setting up Apache and, and MySQL and um, totally figuring stuff out as I'm trying to do it. Um, and not really, a, you know, the, the type of customer you want to learn while doing with. Um, I mean, this thing would crash at, you know, all hours of the night. And uh, my job then basically consisted of waking up and typing reboot um, and just doing that over and over again <laughs> until it came back online. But um, from there, it grew very deeply into like a systems role, um, specifically, you know, focused on WordPress and, and hosting WordPress applications. Um, and then uh, came to work at uh, Automatic around about 2014, um, still in a systems role and capacity. Um, and then um, I would say at some point in there, I, I transitioned to working on the systems team for our, our VIP, our enterprise division. Um, and then two years ago, uh, transitioned from very much the back of the house to the front of the house where um, my role was, you know, my primary application was was terminal and, um, now it's it's Salesforce uh, opened in a tab somewhere. So um, very uh, interesting experience in in making a jump, you know, from from deep engineering and, and systems over to a more sales and and customer or prospect uh, facing role. But um, been a blast. Wouldn't do it. Uh, wouldn't do it any other way. So, and that's why I think this is so compelling of a conversation today is because you've got that deep engineering background. And you have that perspective. And then with your role, you're talking to these, I can't imagine some of the client calls you might have about how to navigate WordPress at scale. We all love yeah. WordPress, but doing it at this scale. I remember our conversation a couple of weeks ago, you gave me an example. It was like, I can't remember. It was like in the hundreds of thousands of uh, requests per like second yeah. and going, man, who wouldn't want that kind of scale, but then going, how the heck do you do all that? And but the other part from an engineering background that you have with clients and how you help them 
uh, sort through what to do. You gave some great examples. We're going to talk all about that in just a second. Um, so we're going to talk about some example clients, but we're not going to use a lot of names. We want to be sensitive to that, but some scenarios, example scenarios, and how sure. Sean works with them to kind of sort through and think through their architecture, their best practices, scale at scale. And um, but first, Sean, I want to just start with the uh, the WordPress VIP story. Uh, you know, oh. I, I've been in WordPress a long time too, and VIP has always been this kind of big silhouette in the background that's like if you want to do WordPress that level this is who you go to and um, but frankly you know I don't think a lot of people know all the story of what WordPress VIP is today um, yeah. I've never had the opportunity to refer a client <laughs> which I would love to at that kind of scale but the work you all do we see it with the backbone with all that WordPress is and does um, and I, that's why I think that's compelling. But could you tell us just a little bit today about WordPress VIP? Sure. Yeah. Um, I wasn't I wasn't there at the beginning um, or near the beginning, um, but very familiar with with the history um, and how this started was just um, needing to run, you know, the the WordPress.com offering where you know you came in, you sign up for an account what you could do was very just sort of walled garden, right? Like wordpress.com surfaced a, a very um, specific and, and curated set of themes. I couldn't upload my own plugins. Um, and we had, there was interest in like, okay, like we have, we're talking to a big name customer. We would put them in an enterprise space. They, they love WordPress. They want to use it. They want to bring it into their organization. How can we, how can we do this? Um, and this was sort of the inception of, of what became or what becomes WordPress VIP. Um, and in the beginning, um, what this was, was just basically making one-off, you know, changes um, for the wordpress.com commercial offering, but making it account for a subset of, of what would become VIP's, you know, customer base. Um, and this introduced just a lot of challenges around Things like scaling and you know separation or isolation. Um, you know the the big Fortune 500 customer was probably on a, the same database server as um, you know my my mother who's who's got a recipe sharing and and kitten photo posting application um, or or photo blog or whatever. Um, and so what would end up happening is that you know given the types of customers that VIP you know retained these customers had very high requirements around security and scalability and, and um, being able to serve the, type, the types of traffic um, that comes with that territory. And so what would happen is that these customers could end up consuming a portion of resources away from WordPress.com customers um, or breaking things for you know, the commercial arm of WordPress.com. And then conversely, you, we would iterate on things for the WordPress.com offering that would then break things for the VIP customers or slow them down or, or cause pain points, friction, things like that. Um, so then, you know, as we move forward, this VIP is growing, we're taking on more customers, um, but it's decided it's like, okay, look, maybe it's time to split these things off into, into two disparate systems um, and have that level of, of isolation, but also flexibility to go in the, in the directions that our customers were asking for and, and, and seeking us out for. So um, that started, I want to say around about 2014. Um, and this is when we, we started building out a platform that um, was, we used Docker. Um, Kubernetes, if you, if you look at the history of it, was very new at the time. Um, and I think we looked at it and, and could see that it was trending, but it just wasn't quite ready for prime time and not the type of prime time that our customers are seeking. Um, and so what ended up evolving from that was just this pursuit of sort of building our own version of, of Kubernetes. It did a lot of the same things, maybe in different ways than, than what Kubernetes became. Um, and then over, over that period of time, what ended up happening was Kubernetes exploded, adoption, popularity, uh, documentation, the community around it. Um, and so that brings us to like the next major, you know, sort of milestone in the history of, of then we started the process of um, seamlessly migrating our existing customer base from the 
the traditional setup that wasn't Kubernetes into a, a platform that's just wholly orchestrated and managed by um, Kubernetes. So that's the 30K view of, of sort of like how it got started and, and how it's evolved over time and the, and the types of challenges that we're, we're coming up with. Well, back in the day, I'd, I'd heard more anecdotally about the infrastructure that ran .com, yeah. and it was impressive. Yeah. Um, and and then VIP kind of spinning out of that makes makes totally sense, total sense yeah. for all of that. So yeah. thank you for that today. Can you tell us to the types of clients that VIP works with? Because um, I've talked to some of the team members, and and uh, I'm curious what what does that all look like. Sure. I kind sure. Of yeah. The clients that say I need I need a VIP experience. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'd say it breaks down into a couple different buckets. Um, one of one of them would be, I guess, what you could what you could quantify as like a marketing type persona. So, um, this is someone who's working at an organization. Maybe that organization isn't using WordPress. They use WordPress maybe personally, or they use WordPress, or they used WordPress at like a prior employer um, and it, it, they want to return to that, right? Like they love the ease of use, they love the functionality, they don't like whatever it is their current employer is using. Um, so we hear a lot from, from those types of folks. Um, and then I would say through that or sometimes directly, you know, if, if a marketing person is the champion, the person who's advocating for WordPress's use and adoption within an organization, what we oftentimes sort of end up coming uh, to interface with is someone who's very technical, right? It's the it's the CTO, it's um, a technical buyer who has the final say or the approval of of like, okay, yes, let's let's get this solution, um, and that's where you have to be able to to just sort of shift and talk to two very different types of people, right? Like, you start talking about Kubernetes and firewalls to a marketing person they're likely to fall asleep. Um, and you try to show something like Gutenberg to a technical person who's trying to evaluate your security posture, you're wasting their time. Um, so you have to be able to, to sort of talk to um, and sort of tailor, tailor your conversation to, to both. Um, and I would say maybe in there or as a subset of one of those, um, it's people that self-host, um, people that have built out you know, stacks um, their WordPress application and it's on AWS, it's on Google Cloud, uh, it's on Linode, you know, um, it's on um, OVH, whatever it might be. Um, and they are just sort of tired of waking up at three in the morning when they get an alert, they want to work on other things or, or be freed up to work on other things. Um, they want to push the, the responsibility of, having to do security updates. And and there's a lot, like we're not just talking about the plugins and the themes in WordPress, we're talking about everything that happens inclusive of that, but above that as well. It's the servers, it's firewalls, it's the software, it's the components, it's all of the all of this PHP, it's Nginx, it's, it's the database, whatever those things might be. Um, someone has to take care of and, and manage that stuff on, a, on something like a, their own stack at AWS. Um, so that's another, you know, sort of, um, Sort of subset that we we talked to, and then I would say the last is um, maybe not one that would fit neatly into those buckets, but it's someone who um, is using a solution that isn't WordPress. And I think these are probably on the end of the spectrum of my favorites because um, something like a Gutenberg just really resonates with those types of folks. Like when you show them. Um, what you can do in Gutenberg and the power of blocks and like the extendability, the flexibility um, relative to whatever solution they're using currently, it's a huge difference um, where they maybe just have like a text area that has, you know, bold italic underline and maybe an ability to link. Something like Gutenberg is such a stark contrast that really wows folks and, and opens their eyes to just how powerful WordPress is and, and what they can accomplish with it. I think with that comment, you just eliminated something for me that I hadn't really thought about because I come way smaller scale and more consumer level. <clears throat> and I, I was just writing for our newsletter today and saying, like, I always look at the different ways 
of publishing from as small as like a convert kit who has a little landing page that will build there. And I pay attention to how they do things. That's the level I come with. But when you're talking about an enterprise level client that doesn't have those type of options, I can totally see how Gutenberg could stand out when you get into a lock system, when you're explaining the bowl to tell, like uh, I go back to the days when I knew people that actually created their own custom CMS and it worked for them. But at that scale, and, I, and again, I haven't been to that level, but when you're thinking, what are those options? They're very limited, right? So right. that's so interesting perspective on Gutenberg that I hadn't thought about is that once that scale, they can't just choose anything like I potentially could as a user. Mm -hmm. There's a very limited set of, of tools and they could be very, and, and I could totally see how Gutenberg can shine. The other thing you mentioned was uh, marketing champ, the marketing kind of side of things. And yeah. I think it's you, but I've heard it from other people too, that, um, you know, what might have taken an enterprise organization months, years, hundreds of thousands of dollars to do, WordPress has taken down that ability, why it's so appealing to marketers at that scale, because there's all these tools laying around. And that's, that's really interesting. I love that WordPress has that edge too. Um, oh, yeah, but sure. those two kind of big buckets you talked about, there's a marketing perspective that I hadn't kind of, you know, fully uh, accounted for, specific at this level of few tools. And then a technical perspective that even needs to lock these things down for certain reasons and maintain, you know, big sites at scale and things like that. Um, what what things and questions do, do the marketer types particularly ask or want oh. to talk about? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I would say a lot of it is rooted in sort of functional capabilities um, or ability to integrate and extend. And I think this is where just WordPress as a solution really shines um, because what you're talking about is a solution that's open source. Um, there's you know an entire community of people, agencies, talent, resources that can be used to build out the thing in the way that they envision it. Um, and it's not, it's not something that's, you know, closed source. Um, you have flexibility, freedom, control to, to make it what you want. And if you, you know, end up reaching for some, you know, extension that integrates with, with your marketing tool stack, um, great. And then maybe, you know, you, tomorrow a new marketing tool stack comes out and it's all the rage and everybody switches to it and there's a plugin for it and you can switch that way. But the point is you were able to do that. You didn't just have this platform where it's a bunch of folks deciding what it what the platform will and won't integrate with. Um, so integrations are are a big part. Like, you know, we want to be able to tie this into email marketing and lead tracking and our CRM and um, all of these different touch points that are just part of a marketing person navigating their day to day, uh, tracking leads, conversions, um, things like that. So I would say that's if I had to, if I had to put my spin on it, it would be like ability to integrate and different things that you can integrate with WordPress with already. We're, we're totally going to camp out everybody on the technical side of things, but it, it it's interesting to me to understand the marketing perspectives too as yeah. people approach WordPress and why really um, this, this totally makes sense because when the recent integration you all did with uh, Salesforce cloud, I believe it was, Yep. I, I go, okay, what is this? I know what Salesforce is, but what is this? And it was essentially, you know, that integration is here's content in your WordPress install that you can select and use for those email marketing campaigns. And I'm, I'm more in this marketing camp than I ever have been in technical. And I go, I could understand that that workflow at that level, trying to send out campaigns, you have, we're, we're working on this on a micro level at post status, but the workflow is just, it's tough. And so yeah. that totally makes sense when you have this virtual panacea of options that give you said freedom. And I thought, I bet that rings every marketer's bell on that level because they have goals, KPIs, right. things they need to get done. And when you have limited access to tools that, it's not just a fancy new thing, but it's also the thing that's going to work, make their work a little better, drive revenue, all their goals. That's that's a really compelling. Now I much better get the uh, the integration that you all did with the Salesforce Cloud option. And there's a and there's a part of it too where they just 
um, I would say like a, a pain point we see frequently is uh, can just be distilled down into um, I need to make changes and I have to wait X number of weeks for a developer ticket to go through and like make some update to our existing stack just so that I can promote an upcoming event or a newsletter or um, something we did, you know, some award we we won, you know, from from the larger industry. Um, and the, and again, that's where it comes back to like what they get from WordPress before you do anything, before you add a theme, before you add a plugin, um, really opens their eyes to like, wait, 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 you're telling me I can I can change this thing up here without I don't gotta open a ticket, I don't gotta wait three weeks for you know someone to make a change like this. So um, yeah, that's a big part of it too. Is just empowering them to move in the directions they need to, to get their job done. Um, way faster. Way faster and, and easier. Um, okay, now thank you for indulging me on the marketing side of things. No, sure. um, let's talk about this, the technical, this CTO, this kind of bucket. The and so, time. yeah, for, for you. <laughs> but I'm, sure. I'm very curious how, how these decisions get made and what thoughts go into it. And I think when you do... My premise for all this is when you do it at this scale, there's so many takeaways for those that don't have maybe this huge news site that continually every day on the Tuesday gets hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of hits um, down to there's some great takeaways for us at different scale. So, okay, we've talked about some example clients and, and for those of you listening, we want to be sensitive to the clients and the agreements that VIP has in place, of course, but can you give me, um, as we start to talk, let's talk about this bucket of technical. They come in and they, they're asking these type of questions. This mm -hmm. goes to frameworks and architecture. This goes all the way down to the gamut that I know you help lead people through. So I'm in this CTO bucket or this technical bucket trying to make some critical decisions. This is where you come in with what you do for VIP, right? Yeah, well, part of and it. Then, I mean, yeah. Um, sorry, did I cut you off there? Yeah. Um, no, no, you're okay. good. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, no, a part of it is like, um, because there, you know, there is the, the whole other part we talked about, which is, um, the marketing side of it. Um, and I would say that like, there's a, there's a big difference there and that like the marketing folks want to know the thing can be, you know, a mile wide and an inch deep and the technical folks want to know it's a mile deep and an inch wide. Um, and it's where you need to have just a, an incredible amount of understanding, um, and expertise and ability to answer the types of tough questions they might sh they might throw at you that um, are deeply technical, um, which you know builds confidence in their choice of of your solution like this platform, um, but also gives them peace of mind that like they're they're making the best decision that they can for their organization uh, and partnering with um, folks that understand and and care about these types of needs and can speak to them um or provide answers to to these types of things so um yeah a bit different in terms of like breadth and depth of knowledge required um with one over the other for sure so can we stand up a couple examples <clears throat> i'll call them blind case studies but someone that maybe comes to to you all and you're talking through needs and work through you know the the particular questions and issues that you you all work through with them as a way to kind of demonstrate on that thought level of like, this is the, the approach. Um, and, and when they're making decisions, I know we talked about even framework choices, how, how this framework or with that framework. Um, but can you give us a couple examples that we can kind of stand up and say, if let's say this type of site A and this type of site need B comes in, I think that'd be helpful as we go, okay, how would A site, think about this what are their unique needs you proposed even some examples and I was like I hadn't thought about that mm -hmm. um, seasonal event level examples from just day-to-day -day ordinary existing on the internet yep yep for sure yeah and I'd say like the easy one the one that um, we sort of often talk about um, and for good reason I think like it's, it's super impressive what was accomplished here but would be um, 538 the statistical analysis and election news coverage um, application obviously has big spouts of traffic over something like an election year or you know, the November of an election year. Um, and what we found was that um, the 
site would was doing about 138,000 concurrent requests per second. Um, and that's great. Like that's, you know, that speaks, that's just a, a great example of, you know, the types of scale that we build this platform around and really focus on. Um, but it's easy to lose a, a small but mighty detail underneath that, which is um, they're not our only customer. So not only were we able to keep this application running at 138,000 requests a second, but we also had zero sort of adverse impact or like a, a spillover impact into any other customer's ability for them and their users to reach um, their application. So that's always a good um, sort of story around um, scalability, but not everybody has those needs, right? Like um, it could be a, I'm trying to think about how to, how to phrase it without saying the name, um, could be a, uh, a product, it's mostly purchased online, uh, health and fitness. We'll call it a health and fitness vertical for home use, um, where they're getting mentioned on TV during, you know, Super Bowl advertisements or by a celebrity on Instagram. So there's a level of you can't always anticipate when these types of things will happen. You know, we didn't know that you know, that this celebrity was going to mention a customer of ours on on Instagram, but um, you have to be ready to scale and have resources available to throw to these applications um, and not just anchor to like, oh, we have to know that this thing is coming and then we do a bunch of stuff to, to get ready to do this. Like we can't always anticipate or, or sort of predict when these types of things happen. Um, and then you, you know, there's people that, uh, customers that just don't need that sort of level of traffic, right? Like it's a, um, it's a customer who just, loves WordPress and wants to use it as a internal sort of internet news announcements um, application. It's behind uh, like a login wall, like, you know, someone you or I wouldn't be able to get to it. Um, they're, they're not going to have a need to serve 138,000 requests. They might not even have that 138 people at their company. Um, but like, this is where it's inter or where it gets really interesting in, in talking to, to different folks in that it's important to sort of clarify or have an understanding of what scale means to them. Um, because two of 538 and these other folks I've talked about, it's the ability to stay online when massive influx of traffic show up. Um, and to other folks, it's it's almost rooted in flexibility, like keeping them like the choice in WordPress and in the platform is one that is rooted in giving them the ability to scale by giving them flexibility. And again, like bringing it back to that whole freedom of choice, not locking them in, um, allowing their organization to scale um, in those different, in those types of different directions. So, um, and then I think another one was, um, you and I had talked about this one. Um, but there, you know, there is a seasonality to it too, for especially for the the com the customers that are running something like WooCommerce, where you know maybe their their busy time of the year is from end of November, you know, through January first or something like that, um, and making sure that those folks stay online because, um, especially with them, there's a direct correlation between when their site is down relative to the revenue that they might be losing as a result of that. So um, means a lot of different things to do to, to different folks, different organizations. Um, and it's, I would say that a lot of them aren't the same, but um, the ability to just keep the lights on in their biggest moments is, is just such a huge part of it. Yeah, when you talked about the election site, um, I was probably one of those. <laughs> during your time, it's one of those requests. Yeah, same. Um, and, and then I haven't been to the site in a, in a while. Um, but during that, that's where you're clicking refresh and trying to see results and things that are going on in our, our political landscape. So I can see sure. that seasonality where they knew that particular election was going to come and could probably kind of theorize around that we need to be ready. Yeah. Um, but then the e-commerce option you mentioned is is you you don't know. You don't know when someone clicks and a viral moment might happen for an e-commerce site too. And I, way back in the day, I used to work at Walmart 
when I was in college and um, the little satellites and the things that did all the, the payments and stuff, they, I, I guarantee you somebody back in Bentonville, Arkansas knew how much it costs a store per minute per, you know, for downtime and things. So I can't imagine too. And if I was at that scale for this e-commerce commerce operation, I'm thinking about that quite a bit, but those, like you said, these, there's some that you can maybe predict and probably prepare for, but the other is this seasonal. So how, yeah. how do you think about that and work with uh, clients on that? Like there's that moment you just don't know, but you want it to happen. Right. You need it to happen. Right. Um, but you want to make sure it's up, it's going. And, and what would be, what, what's some approach from a technical angle and an architecture engineering angle that, you know, at, that that you all work with those particular clients to go okay we can be ready for anything but also we know okay here in november we're going to get this big influx this that's some more time and planning perhaps uh yeah. that you don't want to get into an emergency i guess yeah in those situations yeah. so so how do you how do you all work with clients on that and think through those particular issues and problems yeah no for sure um i would say that um it's it's a balance um that you, a lot of folks I, tend to think that any of these types of problems are solvable if you throw enough hardware at it, um, which maybe is true to a certain degree, but there are very real the sort of maximums that occur at different parts of a, a breakdown of, of a stack. Um, and so the first thing we look at is the customer's application, right? Like, are we, um, we do things in really smart ways in terms of how we've architected the platform and um, how we provide for just page level output caching um, from all these different places spread all over the globe. Um, but if your application is such to where you're basically telling the cache in your response, don't cache this, and you're operating your site effectively with no caching, there's a limit <laughs> under duress for how far that will scale before, you know, either it starts to slow down for everybody or it just topples over completely. Um, so just having like a real uh, sort of deep dive understanding of how the application is implemented um, and how it performs. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of different tools. There's the obvious stuff like, you know, are we, are we doing something like setting a cookie on every response header? caches aren't going to hold that because they think you're trying to to tie a piece of response to an individual. Um, are we adding a plugin that maybe tries to track analytics in the database um, to where every time someone just makes a, a types in your homepage and hits enter in their in their browser bar, not only are they making a request to your application, but they're also making a request that causes a insert into a database table. Um, those types of things especially tend to fall over real quickly under under a heavy level of, of traffic. Um, and stuff like that, but then it's also stuff within the within the application. Are we are you making a lot of external requests that um, maybe it's APIs you're consuming, you know, to surface data within your own application. Um, it could be any number of things, but the point is, is that you're using like WP remote methods to go and get content from somewhere else and then bring it in, parse it and output it or, or store it in some way on the WordPress side. Um, how many of those are you doing? How long is that taking? Um, are we making effective use of like in memory cache, something like an object cache um, to make sure that like, okay, look, if 10 people come to the site, are all 10 of them kicking off those external requests? Or can we just let the first one do it, store that response in cache, and then serve it to the other nine people who are sort of waiting in line? Um, what types of queries are we running in the application? Is it, you know, are you trying to do select star from a table that has a million rows? And then we're using, um, you know, PHP or plugin logic to then loop over that and then to get five that we want to display on the homepage. Um, so yeah, the devil is in the details and like very, just very smart approaches and thinking about this stuff is like, it's the vital foundation that will unlock the ability to more easily scale that application um, on down the line. So it's, it's comprehensive. It's, it's, it's wide. Um, yeah. But 
Yeah. That doesn't happen in our call, I suspect, where you take, let's say, election site and and trying to account for all the things that might play into from a macro scale. We got a seasonality of an election potentially. We've got the just the fact that we're on the internet and something could happen at any moment um, thing. But then those nuances that you were talking about too is is I mean everybody I would suspect is interested in speed and performance. Yeah, making sure the sites you know not down to you know making sure it's always up, but also is it loading fast? Is it you know our users uh, encountering some glitch and some of the sites I've been on too that I suspect might be VIP customers. I go, the, it's not just a WordPress uh, application sitting there. It's multiple things pulling in from different sources that have got to like got to affect all that downstream. And you're kind of relying on is that connection coming in at, at that level? Um, yep. You know, faster, slower, going to bog us down. Um, in that conversation too that we talked about, um, you even went down to frameworks. So. In, in that devil in the details notice is that where you're going through with clients and like going okay what are you what are those backbone for lack of a better word those elements under the tech that you help um uh navigate some of that too um you mentioned specifically some frameworks would someone use this one over this one and talking through some of those too because that all affects you know speed performance all those kind of things too yeah do you remember what those were I'm actually yes, not recalling I, that part. Of the I didn't want to feel like an idiot saying it, um, but it was the it was a different like a JavaScript framework, no, like a React or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So you know, that, you, that's what I thought it was, but yeah, 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 yeah. And that's that's a um, that's a separate part of it that I would sort of put under like a a headless or decoupled bucket or or folks okay. seeking that type of approach. Um, when it comes to the WordPress side and and thinking about building these applications. I mean, I would say the things that I've seen work really well in all the years of doing this is um, there's a stark contrast between the people that keep it simple and understand that that simplicity scales and that simplicity provides portability um, and the ones that just aren't those things. Um, and like, that's, that's the biggest part of it, you know, and just evaluating sort of like, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? What has me reaching for this thing? Um, I would say that like the the most maybe sort of easy example to attach to is is folks that um, will rely on plugins to do something that like a one line addition to a header file might change, you know, like adding some sort of tag. Um, but then this plugin has you know user admin screens and an AJAX endpoint, and um, that's great and all. And maybe the person reaching for that plugin can't just copy paste the line of code into the theme for whatever reason. Um, but what you're doing through that, and this is the type of stuff that particularly our type of customers are thinking about is that um, you're sort of increasing your attack surface. And that's just one example. Um, there's a variety of different ways that that sort of thing starts to creep into the application where we're reaching for things that do a lot to get one part of it that is easily pulled into like a, a one line change or maybe just a you know a quick function call that hooks in at the right at the right moment um and and people are thinking about like how does this affect just sort of like what i leave exposed from uh, an attack um surface standpoint so um yeah keep it simple less is more simplicity scales simplicity is portable i would say are the, my big sort of takeaways there and then talking about headless and decoupled um that's super interesting because I feel like there has been just this rise in the last few years when it comes to WordPress applications and decoupled solutions. And um, who was it? I think it was Aaron Jordan had this great post maybe about a year ago now um, about he pursued a decoupled approach and then ended up yanking it all, all back to just a, a traditional approach. Um, and I think, you know, for our customers, that come in asking about this. Um, it's certainly interesting. It's certainly something we support. Um, I would say, uh, oh, um, Al Jazeera, this is public info. Um, Al Jazeera is probably a great example of this that we have currently where, um, you know, they're util utilizing our Node.js um, infrastructure, but also our WordPress um, infrastructure. And they're, they've built you know, these frameworks and applications on Node.js side that just consume content via GraphQL from, from the WordPress side. Um, but we'd like to ask these folks, like, you know, why are you, why are you pursuing 
this approach. Uh, and disappointingly, I would say that like eight times in 10, it's, I would categorize it as like fad slash shiny ball chasing um, where they can't, they don't do a good job articulating why. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Like everybody should get to use the tools and the frameworks and the stuff that they know and the stuff that they like and they want to work in. Um, and I think this is what makes the the increase in headless to coupled stuff so interesting is that um, we have you know developers who are becoming familiar with really like these tools. Maybe they even work at an organization who's got like an entire component library already built out. Um, and you have WordPress, simple, easy to use, content producers, marketing personas, they love it, they know it, they wanna to continue to use it. We can blend those things. They don't have to be separate or mutually exclusive. Um, and so like when it comes to that and, and framework technology, you know, again, the advice would be the same, just keep it simple, um, but also really explore and understand the reasons why you're, you're pursuing that approach um, because there are some very real complexity trade-offs like from the jump you lose the ability to preview content easily it's now a problem you have to solve for um, because where you're rendering that content likely this node.js application that can be any number of, of different frameworks um, is now separate or decoupled from your back-end um, application so and it goes on from there so but, so that, that's that's excellent thank you for sharing that because you just popped in a couple you know circumstances and instances I'm not even aware of, but my, I, another question maybe to ask this would be, what do you want to know? So let's say 538 the election site kind of, kind of comes to y'all. What do you want to know um, from this level? You know, what are you, how, how are you doing it currently? What mm -hmm. are all these things that are factoring into it? Because, because I think if, if I'm that client, those are the things I want to share and then say, you see all this at scale across your client landscape. You know, likely better than what a lot of others, what things are best and the most appropriate in these settings when you're doing scale. So what are the questions you want to know and you want to get answers to that you need to be able to kind of navigate that? I love to the level of like, we're doing this plugin, you know, you all get down to those details of like, you might be doing this function in the plugin, but it could be a, like your example was a line in the header. That instantly, I, I, I would assume there's maybe a way to calculate that, how much they, they save or they make money on that, but that right there instantly, you got them a result that that is, is likely invaluable. But from your perspective, from an engineering side, as you're going, okay, big site, big issues, what are those things that you think about that you want, you need answers for in order to help them navigate to the best um, solution and, and all of that? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, in just so it's clear, in the context of like headless or decoupled applications, or just in general. No, I'm sorry. Let me step up a bit. New client oh, okay. comes. It's five thirty eight or some other one of our example clients come to you all. Mm. Um, what are the things you need to know first and foremost, and then you know what are you looking for so that you can best help them um, account mm. for these things, or even to those level of uh, detailed degree. Navigation. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, no, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that there's not really a list, right? Um, and one of the traps you might run into having a list where you're just running down a list or giving questionnaires and, and having them for the, it's so easy to forget or leave out or omit certain pieces of information. And I think it just removes like such a, a fun component of it, like just getting to talk to people. Um, a colleague of mine, um, I think he calls sales therapy, right? Like we're, we're here to listen to um, their problems. But like, what's so interesting about that is that oftentimes when you say nothing, they will continue talking and they will just continue to volunteer. Like, very useful information about like what their problems are with their current application and what they're looking for. And through that, um, you just get accustomed to like knowing what to ask relative to the types of things you've other customers have um, encountered. So maybe a good example of this would just be um, having a good accounting of, of external um, 
integrations, like things the application relies on. Um, one customer I can think of um, had it set up so that their old, their previous provider was allowed through their corporate firewall to get access to like some database or, or some set of information. Um, and then they migrated here. No one had recounted that this thing existed. No one had really asked about it. Um, and then as soon as it switched live, huge parts of it weren't working that were reliant on this data because now their corporate firewall is having traffic and attempts to reach it from a new IP space. Um, so it's stuff like that, like making sure you you understand not only like the pain points, but also where the points of complexity lie um, within their existing setup. What sort of integrations is it relying on? How do those things work? Um, and then looking at all of that through the lens of of what you know and what you've experienced from from other customers. Okay, so this could potentially come off as a total noob here, but so you mentioned the things that aren't accounted for, and I suspect no matter how many conversations you're not going to have, there's going to be things that you that within all this context nobody can can account for. Yeah. But I would take it VIP. There's some level of of things to go. We we do account for the uncounted. We does that make sense? Like, so if oh well, in our scenario with the health and fitness uh, client example, mm -hmm. you know, there's not a. They might not have said, well, every third quarter on the third Wednesday of that month, we're going to get celebrity endorsement that's going to send boom to this site right. or whatever those anomalies are. How do you all think about accounting for those things that we can't potentially account for yeah, in a broad technical sense? No, for sure. Um, it's interesting because um, I'm I'm working with um, a group currently where I would say I've spent the most time with them and have uh, sort of helped in them conduct diligence against us to a level I have not encountered with any other customer I've worked with in the two plus years of doing this. Um, and we're sort of like kicking around, you know, that they can have a sandbox, so to speak, on on the platform. Um, and we still find things that like they're accounting for um, or needing to account for in terms of migrating this just legacy application onto a platform. Um, and it, it's it's certainly just a reminder to me that like look we can we can and do spend you know sort of hours on the phone tons of emails exchanged um more so than any other customer at least in my experience and still overlook leave out not have some detail come up until um you really get to to code and migration and deployment and things like that um you, know, you think you can think you can account for all these things, but uh, it's just easy, right? Because these things are um, they can be expansive um, and sort of like how they are built and how long they've been you know running for. Um, this particular application has been around since um, the days of using msfiles.php to handle multi-site. Um, and it's been years since WordPress adopted the change in the path structure for, for multi-site uploads. Um, and like through that, it's just, you know, coming across problems that aren't easily surfaced or, or aren't at the forefront, aren't things you are really thinking about, um, especially as it relates to just what you know and what you've experienced. Mm -hmm. But I would, I would, I would venture to say that you all have accounted for those things that not, not I'm saying random, like, the firewall or something like that, but celebrity endorsement hits system. Yeah. You know, we've we've done this measure of um, baked into the platform as it is that they don't account for random celebrity hitting. Um, you try to account for, for instance, big event. I'm sure with the 538, yep. they would probably disclose. Hey, if you didn't know, an uh, election's coming up in November. Right. Um, but let me move on. So. If I'm if I'm a client, I'm just going to pretend for a second I'm one of these. I want to know, okay, is it gonna is it gonna stand? Is it gonna stand mm -hmm. up and stand at this time? And these things gonna work in a general sense, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, is it gonna be there for me? And then the second is when it invariably goes wrong, which things do, can, will on the web, right? 
Yeah. I want to be able to pick up the phone or something. I want to be able to get somebody on that level. Cause when you're talking about two, they've essentially, they're the ones up at 3 a.m. working on something, an issue. They have offloaded those responsibilities. Those two would be two big things for me is, okay, do I have reasonable assurance this thing is going to stay in those random events, tsunami events? And second is when something just, you know, it hits the fan, I want to be able to go to another, uh, some human yep. and go, this is happening, help me. Can yep. you talk to those two things too as it relates to be able sure. to work with clients? Sure, yeah. Um, and I would say that this is um, just such a valuable part of what it is we do in that um, we aren't just getting a credit card number, tossing an SFTP login in, point your way, and then, you know, saying, uh, happy hunting, you know, um, but it's a partnership. Um, it's, ha it's having and being able to bring a level of proactiveness when it comes to um, not only sort of reaching out with like things that we spot for things that we're monitoring and alerting for on this end, um, but also it's just proactively having the resources, the technology, the engineering prowess to um, survive those things that we don't know um, are coming down the pipe. So, um, and then a separate part of it too, I think folks find value in is um, separation of the platform, the architecture where your code runs, where it's deployed to from um, the application. So, um, uh, and in, in different types of setups, you're sort of like, oh, I, I want to back up um, my data. Cool, I'll get a backup plugin for that. Oh, I, I need to protect my site against uh, brute force attempts. Oh, I'm going to get a plugin for that. Um, and all of a sudden, you, you've got all these boxes checked now, like I've covered off on uh, brute force detection and security and backups and um, all of this stuff. And then you've got a dozen plugins and you haven't added a plugin that actually is going to move the needle towards what your site is going to do or be. Um, and I think we do a really good job here, at least in terms of um, handling and managing all of that upstream from the application and sort of leaving the application, the customer's application, um, equipped to do the things that they want it to do and not be a manager of itself through um, those types of plugins. So, okay. All right. Thanks, Sean. So, I, I kind of lost track of time and all of this, but I want to get to the tips and takeaways too. As you're thinking about this concept of WordPress at scale, um, and we mm -hmm. talked about earlier, like, doing it at scale with some of the example sites and actual sites we mentioned. Um, I think there's takeaways for all of us. As you kind of recap some of your experiences as uh, from an engineering perspective or, or any perspective, the Sean or Shea uh, um, perspective, can you share a couple of takeaways that come to mind for you? Um, for those of us that aren't going to do it scale, but have other things that might be helpful and practical just to know. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, hmm, good question. Um, I would say the things that come to mind for me, at least relative to experiences of being at VIP and scalability, um, there's sort of this approach sometimes that we see in plugins that um, or themes where customers want to use them, they're really excited about using them, it solves their problem, and then we take a look at it. And like the biggest sort of thing that ends up derailing that is just that um, oftentimes, like the developers, the authors of these things aren't thinking in ways of the types of scalability we're, we're having to manage for these folks. Like um, works locally in my, in my BBB environment, um, but it's not conceptualized in ways where we need to think about, you know, oh, it's running in 300 containers across two continents or something like that. Um, so like a good example would just be something simple. Like I want to take a bunch of data and, and export it to CSV. So the request that lands me on the page where I can click the export button gets sent to container A. Um, and then when that's done, the request for me to download the file gets sent to a different container that doesn't have that file or a different server. It doesn't have to be containers. Um, so yeah, it's sort of, you know, thinking about not just how it works in what you can see in front of you, but thinking about how it can possibly work 
in in different scenarios um and then just not making assumptions about um you know the back end of an application existing um for our platform we want to keep those responses fast so to do that we have caching at our edge locations so that um you know, we reduce latency. Someone in making a request to a site in Japan doesn't have to go, you know, all the way to Amsterdam. They can go to and get a cache response right in Japan. Um, but oftentimes, folks get reliant on or make assumptions that every single request into an application is going to hit WordPress. And this isn't necessarily exclusive to just VIP, right? I mean, this is there's a world of Cloudflare and Fastly and um, all these sort of like uh, configurable CDNs that do this stuff for you, those requests are are getting served from their edge locations and they're not making it to um, a backend WordPress install somewhere. So um, yeah, those would be the big things is just needing to think of and, and conceptualize in terms of scale um, for sure. Yeah, so the first one you said, it just made me think, and I'm not trying to pretend to be a <laughs> developer here, but you know, as someone that had a product company that built some plugins and things over the years, um, it made me think that there's this, this question scenario. So if you are at scale, how would this perform as a way to say, um, at whatever scale, we want to knock off um, an, or, or speed up as best we can everything in. And as I know from the marketing perspective, every second counts. We talk about yep. load times for pages and things like that from a marketing side because we we, we are an yep. impatient species. Yeah, right. <laughs> and right. so I, I remember for years I would go to the site and go, why I don't, you know, for, for our scale, I was still going, okay, I want this faster. But as you're building those products, thinking of this scale, could this hit this? potentially could help shave off things that might the blink of an eye people don't even know but every part of that i know from the speed side of things uh it adds up, adds up and matters mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then they could be on uh one of these huge sites and also go because we thought about that so i, I right. like that too from the assumption side is the other i think angle too that you, you mentioned is just don't don't assume people are here in oklahoma city and my internet is not the best by the way but you know uh, making those assumptions that everybody is in the place I am at at this moment and mm -hmm. trying to access those. So those are great, two great perspectives, Sean. Anything else before we uh, wrap it up and say thanks for everybody for coming and thank you for being here? No, I don't think so. It's been great. Yeah, thanks. I always like geeking out or pretending to be knowing enough to be called a geek, you know? And um, today I think it's it. interesting. <laughs> so no, well, thank we've you. had We've had Sean O'Shea over at WordPress. Uh, you just go with Osh. It's Sean Osh. Yeah, Osh. <laughs> like, you know I didn't figure I out how to say it until I was like 11, man. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Don't expect other people to pick it up right away. No, well, I thank you for taking some time, just sharing some of the story. And uh, I think it's very illuminating. I have even more questions when we're going to get offline for you, Christina, and others um, about what you all do, because I think there's even more to this story. Yeah, um, it's not just those Al Jazeera's this big, you know, hell sets to get the celebrity election sites, which by the way, next time election comes up, we're going to have one in a couple of months here. I'm going to be mm -hmm. thinking about that because I'll be back at 538 looking. Sitting there so, hitting refresh, right? Yeah. Going, yeah. <laughs> I was, I was right. right. <laughs> it's going to keep it up. going to keep it up. Good stuff. Well, thank you, Sean. Thanks everybody thank for you. being here today. Another post out is live. Appreciate you all. Okay. We'll thank see you, you next time. Appreciate you. Thanks, Sean. See ya.